You're listening to Today on BBC Radio 4 with Michelle Hussein and James Nochty. The brothers Jake and Dinos Chapman became known as the Enfant Terrible, or the brothers grim of the British art scene during the 1990s. Now they've created a show that is being called Their Biggest Baddest Yet and it opens this week in Hastings, which is where the brothers grew up and one of them, Jake Chapman, is on the line. What are people going to see then in the exhibition? I think they're going to see lots of, um, lots of art, lots of wonderful art that we've made with our own fair hands. Including, including the design to shock kind of artwork that people might know you for in, in the past, the, the kind of thing that went into the sensation exhibition? I mean, I don't, I don't find it shocking. I think it's, I think it's shocking that people find it shocking. Even the, the just to pick out one piece, I mean, the, the, the mannequins of children joined together, penises instead of noses. I mean, you, are you saying you didn't do that with a, with a desire to shock, to stop people in their tracks? I was explicitly told I couldn't say the word penis this early. Jake and Dinos Chapman first exploded onto the British art scene at Charles Saatchi's Sensation exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1997. Their series of perversely deformed childlike mannequins provoked the kind of outrage more usually associated with horror films than high art. Growing up in Hastings was, was idyllic. It was always sunny, um, the sea was always warm, and the ice cream was delicious. No, it was, it, was, it was bleak, it was fairly kind of rough, but then I, I guess it, it is when you're a kid anywhere. You know, it's like a, like, a, like a PlayStation game, really. Avoid the psychiatrics, don't get raped, don't get beaten up, and don't drown. So, it was fun. I think sometimes because we work as brothers, I think this, the sibling thing is, is kind of like a red herring in terms of the, the, the effect that it has in the expectation of the yeah. work. And the point is, is that the conversation that we have about, about the work is more associated with more of, of the philosophical conditions of representation and speculating on, on the experimental side of making art rather than you know, whether we liked our childhood or not. This series is called um, Living With Dead Art. It comes from a book called Living With Art, which is um, a book based on um, contemporary art collectors, I think in, mostly in London and New York, um, and it shows significant works of art in um, domestic settings. So what we've kind of thought is it would be quite interesting to insert works which in some parallel universe, it might, might be that our work would be in this room. We have a Rothko, Clifford Still, a Donald Judd, and our zygotic exposure sculpture in kind of, kind of dominating the, uh, the main part of their front room. I think it's just a, a, a way of, um, you know, rudely inserting our work into a, a place where it doesn't really deserve to be. Tracked back to the Cubist collages, appropriation was a technique employed by Picasso and Georges Braque, who used newspapers and other real objects to represent themselves. The two artists were even known for appropriating each other. Later in postmodernism, artists such as Barbara Kruger and Andy Warhol believed they were recontextualizing the original imagery, enabling the viewer to redetermine a more current meaning. You know, it's quite nice to make these things that have this kind of prettiness to them. And yet they're kind of abject and monstrous. And, you know, so that you can kind of, on the one hand, you can sort of tease sort of generalised notions of beauty by, by employing them for the wrong reasons. We're trying to just ruin the assumption that... Um, Art has some progressive motion to it. That in some ways we can sort of undermine the heroic nature of making art, you know. We can just turn it into something prosaic. Seducing the viewer through irony and verbal witticisms, rather than relying on technical or aesthetic appeal, Marcel Duchamp tested the limits of public taste and transgressed the boundaries of the art world. Joining with the New York Dada, who were less overtly political than its European strain, 
anarchists and nihilists created a new breed of artists who were starting to attack the very concept of art itself. We decided to draw on Goya. We got someone from the gallery to go and buy them for us. The idea of, of drawing on the work was a way of um, amplifying some of the more monstrous or uh, uh, abject elements of the work, which are kind of, you know, maybe perhaps tease them out. I think the question of it being vandalism is actually technically an incorrect, because vandalism is kind of new, normally schematically destructive. Well, what we did with the Goya pictures was, was to draw on them very delicately. So they're more overdrawings than they are uh, acts of, of vandalism. It's an act of erasure of sorts, so it's a way of making a point, but making a point quite firmly. But I think that's part of our argument about the Goya, it's part of the, the institutional framework that kind of somehow suppresses the work by this kind of absurd kind of uh, ethical dynamic, which is to say that these images are almost journalistic depictions of atrocity. Francisco Goya, influenced by Diego Velázquez and Rembrandt van Rijn, in the early years of his career, would go on to be noticed as the most important Spanish artist of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. After suffering from an illness leaving him completely deaf, Goya's work took a change from cheerful and playful to deeply pessimistic depictions of life, suffering and death. Pretty Lisa took an axe gave her captor 40 wax. We're all very aware that dreams and nightmares express things that can't be exchanged in everyday life. So when I have a dream about, you know, killing Dinos, it's because I can't kill him in actual life. It's odd how um, any kind of historical overview of our work has neglected to mention how immersed we are in the culture of, of the video nasty, which was a substantial portion of our entrance into adult thinking. It's not that they were just kind of superficial, one-dimensional films. They were, <clears throat> at their time, the most politically um, accelerated uh, bits of culture being made at their time. Looking back, severed limbs, hideous decapitating devices, and various spare parts. They all slither off the screen. Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. At Tate Britain, passing by the Freud, Bacon and Hockney paintings, you stumble into a dark room full of antiquities on plinths. It's the Chapman Family Collection. Billed as cultural artefacts from former colonial regions and brought back to Britain by family members of Jake and Dinos. In here, the feeling is more of an old, dusty museum than a modern art gallery. But this whole exhibit is a lie. Some French students walked in, and the first student into the room said, ugh, it's just some African shit, and they all walked out. <laughs> <laughs> you feel a fool for not realising it much earlier. But what drove the Chapman brothers to represent one of the world's biggest brands in this way? We're kind of very interested in using symbols that everybody not only understands, but don't, don't really think about anymore. They become yeah. kind of almost un, un, unthought about. If you think about the trajectory of modernity, you know, McDonald's started life, or Ronald McDonald started life as, as something which had uh, emancipatory values, you know, liberating people from cooking food, a kind of like a, that the higher value of modern life. And then it ends up at the kind of the, the, the downside of the trajectory is the kind of litigious clown that kind of has no humor. But they have also had to somehow discreetly shift from being this kind of, um, you know, absolutely fluorescently toxic company to something that they, they think they can camouflage themselves by painting McDonald's green. I'm going back to my old job if they'll have me. I'm no good at painting, never was. Bubbles, you can't just give it up, you daft apus. Nobody's interested in my kind of work. It's, it's, not, it's not ugly enough. It's, it's, got, it's got nothing to say about death or decay or pain or the fucking human condition. 